Excellent. So it's now uh, one o'clock. So on our schedule now we have a Sutta class. Just to make it interesting for you, so these are teachings from the Buddha, from the suttas, and as many people, including obviously myself, looked at these suttas, and first of all we ask, is there any reason why these are always considered authentic? And uh, there's a lot of research being done, especially by Ajahn Pramana and Ajahn Sujata, and you know, we all concluded there's ample evidence to actually to say that these are authentic teachings of the Buddha. Many, many reasons for that. And we're talking about the Sutta and the Vinaya, not the Abhidhamma, but just the Suttas and the Vinaya. And so because of that, we can look at these Suttas, as long as we have a decent translation, then we can know that these are as close as we possibly can get to the actual teachings of the Buddha. So the one I wanted to read out today was from the Majjhima Nikaya. It's a Mahasachika Sutta. There's a few reasons why I'm reading this one out. Uh, it is because it says something about the Buddha's enlightenment, what he did to become enlightened, and also has some very wonderful similes, which I will bring up when we get to them. So here we actually go. Thus have I heard. The reason why these suttas always begin with thus have I heard was because they were recited according to our tradition at what we call the first council, recited by uh, Ananda. Ananda had been the Buddha's attendant for over 25 years. And because of that, you know, he had heard himself with his own ears the Buddha give these teachings. That's why they always start with, thus have I heard. It's Ananda speaking. On one occasion, the Buddha was living at Vaisali in a great wood in the hall with the peaked roof. And if any of you have, have been on pilgrimage to India, you can even visit these places, especially Vaisali. It's north of the Ganges River. On that occasion, when, the, when it was morning, the Buddha had finished dressing and taken his bowl and outer robe, desiring to go, desiring to go into Vesali for arms. And Vesali was one of the, the big cities there. Now, even the Buddha would go on arms round in the morning. Then as Sachika the Jain was walking and wandering for exercise, he came to the hall with the peaked roof in the great wood, the Venerable Ananda saw him coming in the distance and said to the Buddha, Venerable Sir, here comes Sachika the Jain, a debater and a clever speaker, regarded by many as a saint. He wants to discredit the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. It would be good if the Buddha would sit down for a while out of compassion. The Buddha sat down on the seat made ready, then Sachika the Jain went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. When his courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down and went, sat down at one side and said to the Buddha, Master Gotama, there are some recluses and Brahmins, these are other religious teachers in the time of the Buddha, who abide pursuing development of body, but not development of mind. They are touched by bodily, painful feelings. In the past, when one was touched by bodily, painful feelings, one's thighs would become rigid, one's heart would burst, hot blood would gush from one's mouth, and one would go mad, go out of one's mind. So then the mind was subservient to the body. The body wielded mastery over it. Why is that? Because the mind was not developed. But there are some recluses and Brahmins who abide pursuing development of mind, but not development of body. They are touched by mental painful feelings. In the past, in the past, when one was touched by mental painful feelings, one's thighs would become rigid, one's heart would burst, 
hot blood would gush from one's mouth and one would go mad, go out of one's mind. Am I exaggerating this too much? <laughs> this is after lunch. And they always say that these talks after lunch, especially when you do conferences, we always call this the graveyard shift. <laughs> when you were giving talks, that's when people would really start to yawn. So if I exaggerate it, it's just to keep you all awake. <laughs> Why is that? Because the mind was not developed. Oh no, I've said it already. It all seems the same. So then the body was subservient to the mind. The mind wielded mastery over it. Why is that? Because the body was not developed. Master Gotama, it has occurred to me. Surely Master Gotama's disciples abide pursuing development of mind, but not development of body. But, Agiwesana, what have you learned about development of body? This is what he says, Master Gotama, that's our Buddha, uh, was not doing. Well, there are, for example, these other teachers at the time, Nandi Wachakisa Sankicha Makari Gosala, they go naked, rejecting conventions, licking their hands, not coming when asked, not stopping when asked. They do not accept food bought or food specially made or an invitation to a meal. They receive nothing from a pot, nothing from a bowl, across a threshold, across a stick, across a pestle, from two eating together, from a pregnant woman, from a woman giving suck, from a woman in the midst of men, from where food is advertised to be distributed, from where a dog is waiting, from where flies are buzzing. They never get to eat in Australia. <laughs> they accept no fish or meat. They drink no liquor, wine or fermented brew. They keep to one house, to one morsel. They keep to two, three, four, seven uh, houses, seven morsels. They live on one saucer full of food a day, on two saucer full. They take food once a day, once every seven days, thus even up to every fortnight. They dwell pursuing the practice of taking food at stated intervals. But they do but do they subsist on so little? asked the Buddha. No. <laughs> Master Gotama. Sometimes they consume excellent food, eat excellent uh, food, taste excellent delicacies, and drink excellent drinks. Thereby they again regain their strength, fortify themselves and become fat. <laughs> now I'm not talking about me. <laughs> what they early abandoned, they later gathered together again. That is how there is increase and decrease of this body. What have you learned about development of mind? When Satchika the Jain was asked by the Buddha about development of mind, he was unable to answer. Now first of all, I should say, if you don't know, the, the leader of the Jains, one of the leaders of the Jains, was actually contemporous with uh, the Buddha, uh, born in a very same area in the Ganges Valley. And so the leader of the Jains and the leader of the Buddha were living in the same region at the same time, which is always really quite strange why two great religions actually started in about the same place. And it does seem that many scholars actually say that the Jaina religion at the time was more common, more people followed that than the Buddhist tradition. I'm not sure if that's correct, but certainly the Jains were very, very numerous. <coughs> then the Buddha told him, what you have just spoken of as development of body, Akiwesana, is not development of body according to the Dhamma in a noble one's disciple. Since you do not know what development of body is, how could you know what development of mind is? Nevertheless, as to how one is undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind, and developed in body and developed in mind, listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, Satchika the Jain replied, and the Buddha said this. How is one undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind? Here a pleasant feeling arises in an untaught ordinary person. Touched by that pleasant feeling, 
they lust after pleasure and continue to lust after pleasure. That pleasant feeling of his ceases. With the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises. Touched by that painful feeling, you sorrow, grieve and lament. You weep, beating your breast and become distraught. When that pleasant feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because his body is not developed. When the painful feeling has arisen in him, it invades his mind and remains because his mind is not developed. Anyone in whom, in this double manner, a risen pleasant feeling invades the mind and remains because the body is not developed, and a risen painful feeling invades your mind and remain because your mind is not developed, is thus undeveloped in body because the mind is not developed, is thus undeveloped in body and undeveloped in mind. The interesting bit comes later. <laughs> and how is one developed in body and developed in mind? Here, pleasant feeling arises in a well-taught noble disciple. Touched by that pleasant feeling, you do not lust after pleasure or continue to lust after, lust after pleasure. That painful feeling of his ceases. With the cessation of the pleasant feeling, painful feeling arises. Touched by that painful feeling, you do not sorrow, grieve and lament. Do not weep, beating your breasts and because and become distraught. When that pleasant feeling has arisen, it does not invade your mind and remain because your body is developed. When painful feeling has arisen in him, it does not invade his mind and remain because his mind is developed. Anyone in whom, in this double manner, a risen pleasant feeling does not invade your mind and remain, and a risen painful feeling does not invade your mind and remain, is thus developed in body and developed in mind. I have confidence in Master Gotama, thus, says the Jain. Master Gotama is developed in body and developed in mind. Surely, Akiwesana, your words are offensive and discourteous. But still I will answer you. Since I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and went forth from home life into homelessness, it has not been possible for a recent pleasant feeling to invade my mind and remain or for risen painful feeling to invade my mind and remain. Has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so pleasant that it could invade your mind and remain? Has there never arisen in Master Gotama a feeling so painful that it could invade your mind and remain? What about you? All the feelings you've experienced so far in your life has ever been a very pleasant feeling that it invades your mind and remain, like one of Ajahn Brahm's jokes. You can't get rid of it, it keeps coming up. <laughs> or any painful feeling invading your mind and remain. And so the Buddha answers, why not? Here, Aggie Waisner, this is where he comes into his story of uh, his search for enlightenment. Before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva. And if you ever read these books yourself, you will notice one thing. Every time they use the word bodhisattva, it's always preceded by the word unenlightened. Because in Theravada Buddhism, you only use the word bodhisattva uh, for the Buddha, the person to become the Buddha, from the time, from his previous uh, time, he descended from the Tusita realm to the be born in Lumbini until uh, his uh, 36th year when he became fully enlightened. And then he wasn't called Bodhisattva anymore, he was a Buddha. It's only that time for a person about to become a Buddha in his last, uh, in his birth to the time of his enlightenment. I thought before my enlightenment, I thought household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life, utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe and go forth from home life into homelessness. Later, while still young, a black-haired young man 
endowed with the blessings of youth, in the prime of life. Have you ever seen old photos of me? <laughs> 50 years ago, when I put on the yellow robe, I'd shaved off my hair. But I'll let you know a, a secret, that I used to have really uh, big curly hair when I was young. You know, quite big, and it was like my hero was Jimi Hendrix, so that sort of, and where the hair stopped, that's where the beard started. So it's like a donut all the way around. <laughs> I never needed scarves or never needed hats because I had my own insulation with hair. And my mother, my mother was always telling me, get your hair cut. And when I did, she said, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was, it's my mum, so I can't make jokes about her, but some people you just can't please. <laughs> <laughs> and he found a nice place where he could uh, serve for striving. Now these three similars occurred to me spontaneously, never heard before. This is one of the reasons why I'm reading this sutta. These are great similes. As soon as I heard this, I kept it in mind for a long, long, long time. Suppose there were a wet, sappy piece of wood lying in water, and a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. Now remember, in those days, they used to you know, use the two sticks together to create a fire. The two fire sticks. They did not have matches, they did not have uh, cigarette lighters or anything else, just rubbing two sticks together. I remember just as a young monk in Thailand being taught how to do that because sometimes if you're a forest monk, there is no matches, so you have to learn how to make a fire just you know, by those rubbing of two sticks, usually actually twirling them around. It's really hard work. Could the man light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing against a wet, sappy piece of wood lying in the water? No! Why not? Because it's a wet, sappy piece of wood. It's lying in the water. Eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, said the Buddha, as to those spiritual seekers, the recluses and Brahmins, they call them, who still do not live bodily withdrawn from sensory pleasures, and whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst and fever for sensual pleasure has not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally. Even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. Because of their, their stick, their mind is too wet and sappy. This was the first simile that occurred to me. A second simile occurred to me. Suppose there were a sappy piece of wood lying on dry land, far from the water. And a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking, I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think? Could that man light a fire and produce heat by taking the upper fire stick and rubbing against the wet, sappy piece of wood lying far from the water? No, Master Gotama, why not? Because it is a wet, sappy piece of wood. Even though it is lying on dry land far from water, eventually the man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, Akiwesana, as to those recluses and Brahmins who live bodily withdrawn from sensory pleasures, but whose sensual desire, affection, infatuation, thirst, and fever for sensual pleasure has not been fully abandoned and suppressed internally. Even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. And even those, if those good recluses and Brahmins do not feel painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, they are incapable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. That was the second simile that occurred to me. And again, a third simile occurred to me. Suppose there were a dry, sapless piece of wood lying on dry land, 
far from water, and a man came with an upper fire stick, thinking I shall light a fire, I shall produce heat. What do you think? Could that man light a fire and produce heat by rubbing it against a dry sapless piece of wood lying on dry land? Yes. Why so? Because it's dry sapless. A uh, piece of wood. It is lying on dry land, far from water. So to Agiwesna, as to those spiritual seekers who live bodily withdrawn from sensual pleasures and whose sensual desires, affection, infatuation, thirst and fever for sensual pleasure has been fully abandoned and suppressed internally. Even if those good recluses and Brahmins feel painful, racking, piercing feelings, though they don't. There is a care capable of knowledge and vision and supreme enlightenment. I thought, this is a Buddha, uh, talking about his early way of practice, which you know, wasn't all that smart. I thought, suppose in my, f my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrain and crush mind with mind. So that's what I did. And when sweat ran from my armpits, just as a strong mind man might seize a weaker man by the head or shoulders and beat him down, constrain him and crush him, so too with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained and crushed mind with mind, and sweat ran from my armpits. <laughs> this is not recommended, by the way, so don't take notes. But a low, tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But, but because I was exhausted by the painful striving, but such painful feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I thought, suppose I practice the breathingless meditation. Should we teach that later today? <laughs> the breathingless. <laughs> no. Uh, so I stopped the in breath and out breath through my mouth and nose. While I did so, there was a loud sound of winds coming out of my ear holes. We've got to keep this nice and quiet here, so please don't do this. <laughs> Just as there was a loud sound when a smith's bellows are blown. Uh, there was a loud sound of winds coming out my ear holes, but although tireless energy was aroused in me, an unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feeling arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breath and out-breath through my mouth, nose and ears. What I did, so violent winds cut up through my head, just as if a strong man were to crush my head with the tip of a sharp sword. So too, while I stopped the in-breath and out-breath through my mouth, nose and ears, violent winds cut through my head. But although tireless energy was aroused and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. I thought, suppose I practice further breathingless meditation. Are you interested in this? Because <laughs> you know that sometimes people say they're not, but I notice... When anybody visits a place like UK, they always like going to the old castles. And the place I like to go to most of all is the old dungeons and torture chambers. <laughs> People are really weird. They're always interested in sort of uh, extreme things. But anyway, there's a happy ending, so please bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I practice further the breathingless meditation. So, uh, so I stopped the in-breath and out-breath with my mouth, nose and ears. What I did so, there were violent pains in my head. Just as if a strong man were tightening a tough leather strap around my head as a headband. So too, when I stopped the in-breath and out-breath, there were violent pains in my head. But although tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted. There is a point to this, which will come in a moment. 
I thought, suppose I practice further the breathless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths with my mouth, nose and ears. What I did so, violent winds carved up my belly, just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. So too, when I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths with my mouth, nose and ears, violent winds carved up my belly. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths with my mouth, nose and ears. What I did so was a violent burning in my body, just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals. So, pretty gross, isn't it? <laughs> now, although tireless energy was aroused in me, an unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. This is one of the problems. You may have unremitting mindfulness and strong energy, but because your body is not at peace, you cannot find any sort of great insight. When deity saw me, some said, the recluse Gotama is dead. Others said, the recluse Gotama is dead, not dead, but he's dying. Another deity said, the recluse Gotama is not dead or dying. He is already enlightened, for such is the way that enlightened beings abide, which is not true. I thought, suppose I practice entirely of cutting off food. Have you ever tried that, going on a diet? A real diet? No food at all. Anyway, he tried all of this. And then... He decided, whatever recluses or Brahmin spiritual seekers in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future would experience painful, racking and pierce, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. But... Uh, but by this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Could there be another way? You know, it's amazing how in many spiritual seekings, people feel they need to do these austerities, very severe austerities sometimes. And because of that, they think they're going to get somewhere. It certainly does, unfortunately, inspire lay people. Some lay people think, wow, that's really hard to do. That guy must be really serious in his practice. I must have actually gained something. Please never believe that. Now we get to the, the, the nice, juicy part of the story. <laughs> Could there be another path to enlightenment? I considered... I recall that when my father was occupied, while I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, this was usually attributed when he was about six years of age or seven years of age, quite secluded from the five senses, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana with a rapture and pleasure born of seclusion from the five senses. Kind of like fluke to first jhana. Didn't really know what he was up to. But then, he continues, the bodhisattva thought, could that be the path to enlightenment? Then following on that memory came the realization that is indeed the path to enlightenment. I thought, why am I afraid of that pleasure? There are very pleasant states compared to things like fasting and stopping your own breathing. Why am I afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? I thought I'm not afraid of that pleasure since it has nothing to do with the sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. Now, just to make it clear, 
the sensual pleasures here are always considered to be the pleasures of the five senses. So what type of pleasure does one experience in the jhanas? It's the pleasure of the sixth sense, of the mind. And sometimes it's hard to teach things like jhanas in the West because according to many scientists even, you only have five senses, which is a total myth. Even uh, talking about uh, Professor Hawkins, and he's still, actually he doesn't anymore because he's dead. I think he's learned his lesson. I shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> There is that sixth sense we call the mind, which is totally independent from the other five senses. It's not some sort of byproduct of the brain. There's so many lovely stories. Oh. I have to say some of these stories. <laughs> <laughs> There's one, a professor, John Lorb of Sheffield University. I should have checked this out when we were in Sheffield. It's many years ago, 1980s, I think. He was doing research on the shape of a human skull. You know, you look at some people and their head shapes, you know, are pretty usual, but some people have head shapes which are abnormal. You can actually see that. And that was his speciality. The shape of a human skull, does that mean they have some sort of uh, special qualities or some things they're disabled in? Does it affect your intellect or your social cohesion with others? So he was doing research on the effect of a human skull being slightly deformed, whether that would uh, affect many qualities in your life, like intelligence. So whenever he saw one of the students walking in the university campus at Sheffield, who was slightly strange shape in his head, he would invite him onto the program. Or her. Sorry? Or her. Or her, yeah. <laughs> no, girls don't have strange shapes. <laughs> okay, or her, fair enough. Okay, I concede. <laughs> so, anyway, he found this guy whose head was slightly deformed, invited him on the program, and of course they get, you know, a little bit of payment, you know, just basically a bit of pocket money, or whatever it was. And he joined in the program. He happened to be a graduate student doing a PhD in maths, so he's not really quite uh, intelligent. He had a girlfriend, and socially just pretty ordinary. And when they gave him a CT scan of his brain, that's when he found out the boy with no brain. He didn't have a brain. His head was filled with cranial fluid. And I always like doing this test and experiment. Can you please move your head back and forth? <laughs> if you hear any sloshing, <laughs> it may be you have no brain either. <laughs> but they tested it many times. One of my friends who was a doctor in Sydney, I was discussing this, he said, yes, I remember just uh, discussing that case and seeing the CT scans. They did it again, just if they thought there may be something wrong with the machine, but it's real. He has a 1% cortex, 99% cerebral fluid in his skull. Never anywhere close enough to have a, a degree in uh, mathematics or you know, to be a competent, a young man, and able to hold a girlfriend. He should be crazy. But it's true, he became the boy with no brain. I remember asking, what did the other professors do with that in neuroscience? And they said, all they did, this is the words of this doctor, he said, all they did was put all that research in a filing cabinet as an anomaly instead of actually you know, realizing this was incredible, powerful information about a boy who basically had no brain. 1% was not enough to perform the functions which are required to you know, get a degree and you know, go through school and be on the surface an ordinary balanced young man. 
I love stories like that because it's like kind of solid proof. Anyway, uh, so the pleasures of the mind and the pleasures of the body, the five senses, are two different things. And I also said this before on this tour, that it was even Aristotle, I think it was actually Plato, who, suggest, who said that there are six senses. And I know West is really arrogant. We always think that you know, we are the leaders in philosophy, and the Greeks you know, were the leaders in philosophy. But actually the Greeks said there are six senses. They called the mind the common sense, because whatever you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the mind can know. It's common to all the other senses. And I always sort of joke that one of the reasons why in Western culture we get into a bit of a mess is because in 2,000 year, 2,500 years, we've lost our mind, we've abandoned our common sense. And there's a lot of truth to that. We become way too materialistic, thinking that our mind doesn't even exist. Anyway, that's something else. But I consider, said the Buddha, and this is important for those of you who want to get these deep meditations. First of all, I'm not afraid of that pleasure. When you meditate and you get to a deep state of meditation, fear will come up. Fear this is powerful. And this is also to be able to really get into these deep meditations. You have to let go of control. It takes a lot of trust to sit here and just totally let go. You know, we always like to keep something just in case, to guard ourselves, to keep ourselves safe. It's one of the reasons why when you come on a retreat like this, where everybody are good people, usually keeping five precepts or eight precepts, you don't need to have to have any worries at all. You're with a really good group of people. You don't have to be concerned. So the fear of letting go of control, letting your will disappear and your hearing disappear, you don't need to worry, but fear will come up. Just go past it. I remember this one meditator I know very well. He was meditating very deeply, and it's like you can see so the bliss of jhana right in front of you. But it's just too scary to take that one more step. And say, no, it's just too much for me. But then it's so gorgeous. No, I can't. But it's, oh, <laughs> okay, I'm going for it. <laughs> and that's a common experience. It's a sense of, you know, not exactly like that, it's not so gross as that, but certainly that hesitation, because it's the powerful states of mind. So the fear, first of all, and that's my job, to make you never be afraid of these beautiful states of mind. But I also consider, said the Buddha, it is not easy to attain that pleasure with a body so excessively emaciated. So the Buddha thought, I'll eat good food, boiled rice and porridge. I maybe won't call that <laughs> good food, but anyway, food which <laughs> can sustain you. <laughs> now at that time, you know the story of the Buddha's first five uh, friends on the path of five, the first five monks. At that time, the five monks were waiting upon me, thinking, if our recluse Gotama achieves some higher states, he will inform us. But when I ate the boiled rice and porridge, my five uh, bhikkhus were disgusted and left me thinking, the recluse Gotama now lives luxuriously. Now, I wouldn't call that luxurious. Eating nice sandwiches, that's pretty luxurious. <laughs> but anyway, they abandoned him. This is also important. How many other people in that time would actually practice jhanas? Because you needed a pretty strong body and people were very much into uh, asceticism. So they abandoned him. When I'd eaten the good food and regained strength, then quite secluded from sensual pleasure, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana. 
but such pleasant feeling that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. With the stilling of the last movement of the mind, I entered upon abiding the second jhana. With the fading away as well as rapture, I entered upon the third jhana. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana. When my stilled mind was thus purified, bright and unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, this is what happens when you come out of any of those jhanas. The mind is just so, the five hindrances are gone and the mind does whatever you ask it to do. I directed it to knowledge and recollection of past lives. If any of you have a good meditation, when you come out of that meditation, before you uncross your legs or get off your seat, you ask yourself things like, what is my earliest memory? And when you do that, what is my earliest memory? If your meditation was legitimate and you have just come out of a very deep state of meditation, your mind will pick up an early memory so easily, so quickly. With no doubt at all, that was you. There's many... Okay, this one I can say, because I've got to be careful as a monk not to say personal things, because that's against the rules. It's the eighth budget here, even if they're true. I'm not supposed to say it except to monks or nuns. But this I can say to anybody, because it wasn't about a past life memory, an early life memory. When I started doing this, what's my earliest memory? Then straight away, I was back in my pram as a young baby. It's weird, it's not like you remember it, it's like you're back there. So you can explore that pram. And one of the things which surprised me was that I recognized everything, including my mother, not by how she looked or what she was wearing, but by how she smelt. It was weird. Even my pram, I recognized it by its smell. And even a little toy which I loved, Porky the pig. <laughs> it was I was only just born in a few weeks, and I still remember its name, you know, from that memory. And my mother used to shake it and it made me laugh. But then when you come out of that, you know, I told a few people, and you have lots of disciples that always. Uh, interested, and some are doctors who specialize, you know, in babies, you know, gynecologists or whatever. But they also told me, and I think many of you who are doctors or know these things, know that the first part of the brain which develops, the, and the part which uh, recognizes senses, the sense of smell develops first of all. And I, t I tell you, it's not so much as a joke, but it's true. If you have a kid, a young kid, please don't uh, change your perfume. To a kid, it's like it's a different woman who's holding it. That's what they recognize you by. Anyway, <laughs> it's really good fun. But here the Buddha is for remembering his many past lives, not just an early memory. And one of the other things when you have those t type of memories are you sure it's true? Are you just imagining, fantasizing? If it really is one of these past life memories, it is the sense of doubt, that fifth hindrance has disappeared. And that fifth hindrance of doubt, when it disappears, is strange, but you know that what you experience is real, it actually happened. You have no doubt whatsoever. And that's the hindrance of doubt. It's one of the first times you really penetrate to know what that hindrance actually is. Anyway, and so the Buddha directed it to knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of being, rebirth. And then after that, the second true knowledge was how beings are reborn, how the law of karma works. The law of karma is a very difficult thing to teach. 
It's not actually how you expect it to be. It's not just reward and punishment. When you die, what will happen to you? Sorry, I always have to make it a little bit um, silly because that's my nature. <coughs> this was a true story happened recently in the Punjab, told to me by one of the monks over there, <laughs> Nibs. He said that in this village in the Punjab in India, all the f women had the surname uh, Kaur, all the men Singh, or Mr. Singh and Mrs. Kaur. Now, because that was a common surname and a co for everybody, there had to be at least a couple of women whose first name was similar as well. So anyway, one of these elderly women died in the morning. The doctor came. This is not the you know, backwaters of India. They checked her out. She was dead. So they arranged a funeral service for her, which usually had to do, be done the same day in the evening. So they called all the relations in. They got the casket, put her in the casket, arranged the funeral pyre for her to cremate her. But then, before the funeral uh, happened in the evening, she came too. She woke up. And of course the doctors were surprised. You know, according to the doctors, she looked like she was dead. And everything told her she was dead. But she woke up. And then she told the story the out-of-the-body experience which she just had. She said, <laughs> you interested? <laughs> Have we got time? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> she said that when she died the first time, these two spirits, that's how she described it, grabbed hold of her and dragged her to this place where she'd be examined by this a uh, big shot spirit. <laughs> and this big shot spirit, <laughs> I don't know what to call them. <laughs> big shot spirit took one look at her and started scolding the small spirits. You've got the wrong Mrs. Cor. <laughs> Take her back. <laughs> That's what she said. And so they took her back and then she kind of came too. This is not a joke, this apparently happened. That's what she said. And then, uh, so she wasn't cremated. But it didn't matter all that hard work because a few minutes later, another Mrs. Cor died. <laughs> this time they got the correct one. <laughs> I always like saying that. You know in Bodhinyana Monastery, where I live, there's Ajahn Brahm and Brahmali. <laughs> it's not that much different. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> is it okay to finish? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not that far more, is it? Yeah, that's no, not that much for, further. <sighs> yeah, I know, but I was going to do another one tomorrow. Is it? Actually, there's quite a lot. No, it's not that much. So that was always a break. We can always just yeah. adjust the time, yeah. <laughs> you go into timelessness. But what was interested, after getting the um, insight into um, past lives, who you were in the past, then it's much easier to find out about the law of karma. That was his second insight. And then the third insight, which he got that night, uh, was directed to knowledge of the destructions of the outflowings of the mind. I directly knew as it actually was, this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Four Noble Truths. He, he became enlightened. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the outflowing of uh, the five senses, outflowing of being and outflowing of, of delusion, asawas. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge. It is liberated. I directly knew. Birth was destroyed. The holy life has been lived. 
what had to be done had been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. So that's how the Buddha became enlightened. The three insights. I don't know why it is, but so often people don't talk about those three insights. They have all sorts of other insights they talk about. But those three insights were the knowledge of your past lives, the knowledge of how that karma works, and the big one, the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. So that's why if you want to do insight meditation, go for broke. <laughs> okay, now we'll behave. <laughs> we have now completed the Sutta class. Was that kind of interesting? Okay, yeah, see, yeah, hey. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, very good, excellent. Yeah, you're very good now. Bikuni, sorry. <laughs> okay, so now it's a pseudo class. We have a break. What time is it? Oh, yeah, 13.50. Ten minute break. And after a ten minute break, we have a guided meditation. Is that a nice thing? Okay, so have a break. <laughs> Sorry? A oh, silent, yes. Please. Shh. But having a break means not breaking the rule of noble silence. You can break a leg, you can break, break wind, but don't talk. <laughs> okay, for those outside, this is the last boarding call. <laughs> this will be a 45 minutes guided meditation. The guidance I will give will be just at the beginning. And honestly, sometimes if I'm guiding a meditation, I'm also doing the meditation. And which means sometimes I get so peaceful, telling other people to be still and silent. And it, it does get hard for me to continue on. My mind says be quiet so I can enjoy a nice meditation as well. So I usually just leave it for about 15 or 20 minutes. But the meditation I'm going to guide today is a special meditation. It's, I call it the Emperor's Three Questions meditation, which is so helpful no matter what state of body or mind you're in. For those of you who remember the Emperor's Three Questions were, when is the most important time? Answer? Who is the most important person? <laughs> Not Fenimal Chanda. <laughs> We're in front of you. Yeah, okay, you are, yes. <laughs> no, the thing right in front of you. And what is the most important thing to do? Okay, yeah. great, excellent. So that's what we do with the meditation. The only time you ever have is now. Whatever's right in front of you is the most important meditation object in the whole universe. And what you do with it is you care for it. It's extremely simple, highly effective. You don't have to have pleasant meditation objects. You may have a tummy ache, you may be sick, you may be really tired. That's fine. If that's right in front of you, that is the most important meditation object in the world. And all you do with it is care for it. As I said this morning, if you have the anger eating monster, if you care for it, it gets smaller and smaller and vanishes. It's incredible, that's how it works. You think that this pain, this uh, difficulty, this memory is going to get worse and worse, but if you're kind to it, it just gets softer, more peaceful, more beautiful, and smaller, and then it vanishes. 
beautiful way of dealing with very big problems in the mind. Okay, so the last of our passengers has boarded. <laughs> Tell the pilot's ready to take off. <laughs> you are the pilot. So please close your eyes. And with your eyes closed, hopefully you'd experience the most important object is your body right now. You can decide not to listen to the talk which is being given, but this body is always there. It can interrupt you, it can give you a lot of pain, a lot of peace. I always look at my body as being my best friend, or one of my best friends. So when I start meditation, I always make sure my friend is comfortable and happy first of all. I deliberately check all my robes and my belt was on a bit tight. Check how my feet are on the, the chair. I'm not that used to meditating on chairs. So I pay a bit of extra attention, making sure everything's in a good, good position. And I don't care how long I take caring for my body. It's important to me. I can close my eyes and forget about every one of you. But wherever I go in the world, my body goes with me until death. I make sure I'm caring for it. Not exploiting it. In meditation, I try and make it as comfortable as I possibly can. <laughs> Once it is comfortable, if ever during the meditation I need to move it, I will. It's almost like showing that I do really care for it. A lot of times, if you have an ache or a pain anywhere in your body during the meditation, if you need to adjust the posture, please do so. It does disturb the meditation, but far, far less than if you have to enjoy the aches and pains when you don't listen to your body. So now I'm here, in this moment. It's a very beautiful sound. Oh. <laughs> You're with your body. My definition of mindfulness always was present moment and silence. So you don't give things names. You don't try and describe it. You don't even need to take notes. In meditation, the mindfulness, when it's silent, becomes so strong, whatever you experience is easy to remember. You don't need to say, oh, I must remember this, I must figure out that. Just gather the data first of all, the important things you will remember at the end. So right now, I'm in this moment, the only time I ever have, that's why it's the most important time. What am I aware of right now? Believe it or not, for me, 
I'm aware of an itch on the edge of my nose. I'm going to care for it, not try to get rid of it, not try and uh, keep it, but just caring for it. Little itch, you can stay there as long as you like. When I say that, it disappears quite quickly. Simply because I'm kind to it. Open the door of my heart to whatever feeling, thought, emotion is in my head in this moment. Because I give this moment, whatever it is, kindness, it softens. Just like that anger eating monster, whatever it was which was disturbing me, gets softer and smaller until it vanishes. You can see that I'm being at peace with things. I'm making peace, being kind, and being gentle, which is a reasonably good translation of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. <coughs> if I want to experience peace, I have to make peace. The only place I can start making peace is now. I have to be kind, patient. Then peace just grows. It grows beautifully. Now is the only time I ever have. <coughs> Whatever comes into my mind right now, I let it in. Welcome it, make peace with it, be kind with it. And if it's something unpleasant, I always remember the anger eating monster. I trust these teachings of the Buddha. You're kind to it, it doesn't last long. When it disappears, now what am I aware of? I'm always aware of something, but I'm careful not to feel I need to give it a name. I never need to justify it, to name it, describe it, figure out its importance. It is important because it's happening right now. Keeps the meditation very simple, but extremely powerful. <coughs> now is the only time. What's right in front of you right now is the most important meditation object in the whole world. And I'm kind with it. I care, I'm soft. And the way I look at this object in this moment, if I give it care, it's caring back. If I just give it this beautiful kindness, it realizes I'm a friend and it stays with me. I don't have to imprison it with will. I don't have to control it. I'm just with it, peacefully, kindly.
and every time I meditate, the journey is really interesting. How the meditation object I start with starts to simplify, change, become more subtle, more peaceful, more joyful. And often it takes me at least into nimittas, if not deeper. Give it a try. Please excuse me, but I'm putting down the mic now.
It's getting close to the end of the meditation. How do you feel? How was it? What worked? What didn't work? <coughs> Always like doing a little debriefing at the end of every meditation. So nothing is ever wasted. And it's now time for some walking meditation, followed by silent meditation, tea break at uh, 20, to, 20 to 4. There's only guidelines. If you wish to carry on meditating here as is, please feel welcome to do so. Just if you get up and uh, sit down, please remember to be like a burglar. If that doesn't really understand that, just pretend you are training for MI5 so you can get out of this room without making a noise. You can sit down without making a noise. No one sees you or hears you coming or going. Okay, I will see you again at 4pm. <laughs>